first thought is, you know, myopia is perceived today as just a refractive error. And it's critical that we perceive that as a progressive chronic disease. Um, and in that context, there's so much scientific research evidence already that every diopter reduction could result into a significant reduction of visual impairment. Um, which is why every diopter matters and early intervention is key. And we look forward to a day when um, every child that goes to see a professional who has a myopia is fitted with a myopia control solution. Yeah, I would say that you know one of the key aspects of myopia control today is the awareness or the lack of awareness amongst not only the community parents but potentially the professionals as well. So we are at Cooper Vision are very committed to foster that collaboration and that awareness and the education. Um, so I think one of the key elements is the urgency to treat and to treat more and to treat early, like you said. Um, so one of the prime examples is here in Taiwan, we are holding our third Asia-Pacific Myopia Management Symposium where we have almost 250 guests plus more than 1,000 online. Uh, so that's our prime example, but we will continue to do this awareness, education, partnership with the professionals locally as well. So that's one part, right? Then the second part is, of course, evidence-based research. So we have a, a whole portfolio of products for myopia control, one example of which is, you know, we have a seven-year clinical study where we have shown the reduction of myopia progression by more than 45% among children. And that's the only FDA uh, approved uh, soft contact lens uh, for myopia control uh, called MySight. So I think again, it's evidence-based research. We continue to do that uh, as well as building awareness through education with uh, professionals. We are so encouraged by the energy and the passion that results into the same room. Um, and then we amplify that through um, online broadcasting as well. But I think just the level of knowledge and the exchange that happens is just amazing. And you know, we have ECPs from Korea, Taiwan, US, UK, sharing their knowledges. And I think that is so valuable that we're finding this to be a, a great forum and we want to continue to do this and we want to take it to different markets over time. When we look at the prevalence of myopia in Asia Pacific, it's mind boggling. And today you heard so much about how the the pandemic has increased the level of myopia to an unbelievable level. So for us, this forum of Asia Pacific Myo Myopia Management Symposium was to just start creating the right dialogue among all the different stakeholders in the industry, in the profession, the clinicians and um, associations, everybody, because we felt that by creating uh, a, an opportunity to exchange more ideas and share the learnings and more often that we could um, impact the, the end outcome of myopia significantly. Um, because as, what, as I said, you know, we, there's so much research out there about what we could do and there are all the tools. The, the problem is they're still in single vision correction lenses. Um, and not enough of them are being fitted into the myopia control lenses. So we think that we, we need to just start impacting the willingness and the confidence of the professionals and start more dialogues together. So that's really what this forum is about. And you know, for me also, it's been a learning journey. Uh, I've been here uh, a year or so and in this role for a few months. And you know, it's really impressive to see how much of a burden of a disease myopia is. And as you heard today, um, also WHO considers this as a major public health uh, burden. And on some of the numbers that you have heard and I've heard is pretty impressive. Like today, I think almost 30% of the population has myopia, and there's not just kids, right? Adults. And that may re lead to about 50%. That's almost four to five billion people. And one of the numbers I didn't hear today, but I've read is almost one billion of those may be high myops. And what does that mean, right? I mean, we've heard a lot about the risk of having myopia, but what that means for later diseases, ocular health, like glaucoma, retinal detachment. So I think one of the things we heard a little bit is on the socioeconomic uh, aspect as well. You know, I think Taiwan, they put up a number like $150 million worth of, uh, or Korea it was. But globally, I think the number I've seen is $250 billion uh, worth of economic impact. 
that is because you know kids have difficulty probably learning they have issues with their jobs later on even like you know types of jobs that they can do so th that does have a lot of even socio economic uh, burden that uh, beyond just you know um, eye disease um, so i think this apmms is the third year today uh, this time and you know that is cooper vision's vision is to partner with organizations institutions to really bring people together grow awareness but also provide a good educational experience so that they can take it back uh, to the uh, to the country as well and that's why partnerships with uh, uh, universal and local partnerships are very important we can do it globally but we need to also partner locally uh, we will talk a little bit about treatment i i guess and uh, we haven't talked too much about you know our what we do uh, from a research perspective we have one of the you know longest we have the longest running Uh, clinical study for soft contact lenses on myopia. We have seven-year data for that, and um, you will see more efficacy data, which is quite impressive. And uh, something also to note is more than 250,000 kids are using our soft contact lenses on my site. Um, so not only do we have a long history of data, but a long history of usage also with uh, 250,000 kids. So there's a lot to talk about, uh, even from that innovation that Cooper Vision brings, not only education and awareness, but also innovation in in the product side awesome. as well. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. Pichong Lin, uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Universal Eye Center Groups, uh, which uh, cover uh, 30 uh, uh, clinics uh, in Taiwan and 11 in mainland China. So we have a uh, Operation uh, across uh, the state uh, for uh, for the uh, region and countries, and so I think uh, for the uh, long term uh, uh, myopia management uh, in Taiwan, we have only uh, very few needs, uh, such like uh, uh, pharmacological uh, drugs uh, like uh, atropine, and and then uh, later come uh, later on we have. Uh, Uh, auto keratology uh, and to which just uh, proved the uh, the evidence based in recent years, but uh, we can see uh, from the same theory background, uh, we now have a, a new a newest uh, technology and have offer uh, much more uh, convenient uh, than uh, the previous uh, auto keratology, uh, which is uh, my side uh, as uh, offered by the Cooper Vision mm -hmm. and. For a uh, uh, general practitioner, uh, for the primary care about the uh, patients, uh, we think uh, the uh, myopia uh, management uh, will be more and more important because uh, for recent years, uh, maybe uh, after uh, the smartphone invented uh, in uh, 2008 by Mr. Jobs, that's uh, increased use of the uh, smartphone and uh, tablet. Uh, and Uh, increase actually uh, very heavily in the myopia prevalence uh, in uh, uh, school children and adolescents, and that's uh, caused a big problem uh, not only for the uh, myopia collective uh, means, but also it's actually a disease where influence the uh, patient's visual health that long. So, but uh, actually in the uh, <coughs> Uh, real world, the awareness of myopia control is very low, mm -hmm. and the uh, exchange of myopia control means a still lack of the uh, appropriate uh, platform. So I think uh, the uh, APMMS Asia Pacific Myopia Management Symposium, uh, right now the third uh, uh, meeting uh, offered by uh, Cooper Vision, uh, we are very honored uh, to be co-host in Taiwan. Uh, it's very important for uh, the uh, connecting platform to uh, uh, connecting uh, all the experts worldwide and uh, the uh, eye care professionals and uh, uh, also the uh, tool means and methodology and about the uh, modality too and uh, to uh, exchange a very comprehensive uh, management style. And, To help our patients uh, prevent uh, prevent them from the uh, impairment, visual impairment from uh, myopia uh, for their lifelong. Actually, uh, as uh, 
uh, one of the uh, speaker in the meeting said that every pair uh, after means that which means that if uh, the myopia uh, will influence uh, the patient for lifelong not only in the high myopia group but also uh, even in the low miles so I, we think <coughs> that's a very uh, good uh, meeting platform and uh, we as a uh, uh, primary care uh, eye clinics where uh, we extensively uh, contact with uh, the uh, uh, school children, children and uh, that is uh, very uh, helpful for us as well as I think for other uh, experts or eye care professionals in the world too. So we would uh, like to thank uh, uh, co to offer us uh, this uh, uh, partnership. Then we can uh, do a, a, a lot of job and we can learn a lot and also we can apply and connect him uh, with all the uh, experts worldwide and with that uh, to uh, mutual uh, learning too. And we think that's a very good meeting. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Li Lianfu. I'm from the Singapore National Eye Centre. I'm also the consultant ophthalmologist specialist that I specialize in refractive as well as in myopia surgeries. So I'm also the clinical uh, assistant professor at Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. As myopia is a booming problem in Singapore and SNEC being one of the leaders in healthcare, eye care in, in terms of uh, myopia, we recognize the need for formal training and hence we set up a myopia fellowship which is uh, one of a kind because uh, various there are various uh, subspecialty fellowships around the world we have uh, pediatric ophthalmology, retina, glaucoma, cornea and so on but myopia SNEC is the first to set up as a formal training and I was the first fellow who has completed the formal training at Singapore National Eye Centre so as the, the being very privileged to be the third time uh, participating in the APMMS. It is a very innovative and uh, brilliant platform, I must say, that connects various stakeholders ranging from industry, various eye care professionals, including optometrists, ophthalmologists, as well as other healthcare professionals who are interested in this booming field of myopia. So everyone will have a role to play in this myopia landscape. And with such a platform in place, which is held annually, everyone from the region can come together, or even globally, I can foresee in future, come together and set their uh, goal standard in terms of myopia management and contributes to this particular field on how we can further manage this problem that is uh, an epidemic that is booming into a pandemic. As a partnership, Ring organizer uh, with uh, APMMS on the second APMMS together with uh, Cooper Vision. SNEC has received a lot of very good feedbacks on the entire program. Usually for conferences that is held for either ophthalmologists or op op optometrists or opticians, it is held separately. So it is very exclusive. So ophthalmologists have ophthalmologist conferences and uh, optometrists and opticians have their separate conferences as well. But uh, with this APMMS, we bring eye care professionals together. Not only that, but also from the region and globally, as well as our various industry partners that play a critical role in handling this booming problem that is myopia. So I think it is uh, definitely a, a platform that everyone will be looking for and forward to for every year to be held in order to learn the latest developments, updates and also understand what our peers, colleagues in various uh, different markets, for example, I understand how Taiwan, you know, Korea and even Japan, how they are managing myopia and I have a lot to learn from them and be taking notes throughout this you know, two-day conference. And hence, um, I'd like to conclude with this uh, video interview that you know, myopia is definitely a problem that is booming from an epidemic into a pandemic. Everyone has a critical role ranging from uh, eye care professionals to industry partners to policy makers and even parents and children themselves in managing myopia. So we should all join forces hand in hand and handle and combat this problem together. So today, when you ask anybody, even the practitioners would tell you that myopia is just a refractive right. error. 
mm -hmm. right? And, it, and if you ask, do you believe it is a disease? And a lot of them will still say, mm, not so sure. And I think there's so much scientific evidence around, and you heard from uh, Professor Bullimore, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the risk of the, it, all the diseases and leading to visual impairment is so big. And yet people think, ah, you know, I had myopia when I was young and I was fine with it. So my kids, what's the problem? And I think it's this mindset and that, that awareness that we're trying to address. And there's so much evidence, but it's not trickling down enough to the public. The science about the myopia control is uh, developed uh, with the evidence base just in recent years. So actually, uh, most of the uh, uh, ophthalmologists or eye care professionals are not well educated about the uh, concept of the myopia control can effectively uh, actually control the myopia population. So uh, they don't yet even have the uh, importance of early intervention, uh, maybe as early as uh, five years old memory young or maybe three young. So that's the part, the key part of this. They don't have the such kind of uh, uh, medical uh, knowledge uh, in the school or after, uh, in the medical school or after the medical school, in the education. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, uh, take uh, Taiwan's uh, Ophthalmologic Academy as an example. They, are, uh, they would hope uh, only in these two years with the myopia control uh, meeting or symposium as that such kind of section. In the past uh, three years or four years uh, ago, there's uh, there are no uh, uh, emphasis, enough uh, emphasis uh, on these topics. So, so it's, uh, that's I think that's the key uh, issues. Yeah. And the second is uh, in most countries, of some marriages are different practices. Uh, with optometrist, mm -hmm. so uh, so that's uh, you can see that uh, ophthalmologist uh, was prescribed with a prescription of the uh, uh, contact lens mm -hmm. or aspect for for spectacles, spectacles, but they are should be served served by the optometrist or optical stores. So actually, that's a two different. A scenario <coughs> or kind of a yeah. eye care profession. Mm -hmm. So combine together. Yeah. Uh, for our uh, universal eye center group, actually we bring those two together mm -hmm. in order to offer the patient one stop solution for vision problem. Mm -hmm. So we have a uh, clinics, uh, eye clinics and the optical store in nearby so that the patient can have uh, benefit from both service and uh, technology tools. Uh, or means that either from context, uh, from uh, or also uh, soft uh, like uh, my size, that's very important, and also for the spectacles uh, with a specially myopia control. I think that's a very uh, so that require a lot of work to get awareness mm -hmm. and to get the, the mm -hmm. eye care professional to uh, unite together to enhance such kind of. Uh, Serious problem. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's Just a Just to give you a yeah. sense of how new all these developments are, a little bit of a personal story would be you know, I was a marketing manager for another contact lens company about 20 years ago, mm. uh, and one of my projects was to, to write a proposal to convince the headquarter, the US headquarter, on why we should be investing into research and development behind myopia control. Wow. And at that time, I remember <coughs> thinking, wow, it feels like a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. Like, could this actually come true someday? And you know, in that last two decades, there has been such a tremendous progress. And sure. now you hear from the professionals, and you know, it's not about why myopia control, it's why now, right? And, and it's also what's the cost or the impact of not treating, which is a, a, a completely a, a big evolution. Yeah. But I think because it's been in the last two decades, and if you think about the professionals that are practicing today, they haven't gone through that, right? These, these, all these are not taught in school, yeah. which is why these forms are so important yeah. to now bring it to them. 
So basically, I think your question boils down to how can we uh, collaborate with the community eye care professionals because myopia being such a big problem in Singapore, the number of ophthalmological or tertiary care is limited and the burden of um, disease is much higher than we can cope. So generally, we have uh, tried to collaborate with the community optometrists in terms of managing stable myopia patients. So in Singapore, because uh, atropine is an eye drops that can only be prescribed by ophthalmologists but not by optometrists. So those patients who does not require atropine eye drops and they are fairly stable or moderate to low myopia, we will tend to get them to see the community optometrist. And if needed for, for example, uh, additional of eye drops or starting of eye drops treatment, then they will be referred back to see us. So there will be an inter-collaboration and we are looking at sharing data as well so that you know, the data of a patient can have a seamless flow whether they are seen in the community practice or at the tertiary centre. In managing myopia, I think it is, uh, there, there will be a portfolio of various myopia control treatment. What we are targeting in myopia management is the gold standard which means we want to have personalized treatment to each and every individual patient which comprise of their age, their gender, their lifestyle, their, their myopia progression as well as their degree of myopia because each of these treatments has its own pros and cons and limitations. What suits one patient best may not suit another patient. So how do we go about personalizing treatment? So in our portfolio, what do we have now? We have myopia control contact lenses, there's my sight and auto K lenses and uh, we do have myopia control spectacle lenses as well as various concentration of atropine eye drops. These control treatments are not exclusive which means that if even if you use one control treatment doesn't mean you cannot switch over to another treatment or in practice, in clinical practice, we can also do combination therapy. We combine optical with pharmacological together. In my side, <coughs> in the seven-year uh, clinical trials, we saw really impressive levels of compliance. Wow. So yeah. once you compare, you know, let's say glasses versus contact lenses, mm -hmm. glasses every time it's very easy to take off. Obviously, contact is the one you put it in, you stay. So I have seen even like lens up to sixteen hours in contact lenses where in the my side trial. So ten plus hours is very common, but even up to sixteen hours. So that's why contact lenses probably from a compliance perspective is easier mm -hmm. uh, to manage. And also in that study, we saw, I think, 9 out of 10 kids preferred contact lenses over other types of control in the study. So again, both from compliance as well as preference, yeah. seems like soft contact lenses is pretty uh, is a very reasonable choice. And I think if you listen to Dr. Maria Lu's session, hopefully mm -hmm. later, um, she talks about how it, it also depends on the patient's maturity and the willingness and sort of the, the will. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So if they want to try contact lenses and they're old enough to handle it, then one day my site works beautifully for them. Um, so it really depends. Right. Yeah. Uh, according to our experience for my site for the past three years, uh, we see uh, the uh, uh, continued uh, use of this uh, uh, one day uh, disposable uh, contact lens is uh, has a very higher uh, customer uh, uh, experience uh, with the continuity use uh, the lens. From a retention uh, perspective. Retention, yeah. Uh, because I think it's uh, uh, just like uh, disposal of contact lens, yeah. uh, uh, popular, popularity. Uh, because it's uh, very convenient. If once you, you adapt that, mm. then it is uh, no problem for you to uh, adapt this kind of lens in your, your later uh, on. Yeah, so that's... Uh, but, and also, it can resolve the problem that uh, autocatalyst cannot resolve such kind of uh, uh, young, uh, younger uh, uh, children, mm -hmm. uh, maybe below uh, uh, 9 or 8, uh, and the regulation also prohibit uh, those children for now. And also, those uh, uh, patients who uh, are entitled to uh, nightwear uh, are kind of like uh, autocatalyst. So that will depend on how far the patient experience and also uh, the uh, parents' preference also concerned. Uh, but once the patient uh, is uh, uh, get used to that, 
exciting uh, and also uh, affordable with the, the price, yeah, then it should be no problem. Because many of the uh, parents are also a candidate to work. Mm. <laughs> so one of them not. So that's mm. it, the thing is, it is uh, not uh, difficult to say yeah, in, in this uh, aspect. Yeah. So that's uh, it is a very good choice. If once the, the, you will get uh, the uh, retention rate very high. Yeah. Speaking about early intervention, I guess we everybody spoke about early intervention in key. One of the things that we find is that you know when the child are when the child is very young, you go see uh, do an eye exam maybe once a year, and you find that maybe the, the child has a minus zero point five, and a lot of times parents will say yeah it's still mild, uh, maybe I'll see next year, and then the next year come around and then maybe now it's one point zero. And the eye doctor might say, you know, you might want to think about myopia management. Then, yeah, okay, I'll think about it. So by the time they actually come around, two years could pass, and the child could be minus two already. And, and I think it's that early intervention that we're trying to impact, and it's a lot more challenging, which is why we need your help in, from a media perspective. Yeah. Yeah, to add on is still a myth, you know, in Singapore, yes. which is such a developed country, I still have parents coming in to decline wearing glasses mm. for their child, yes. just because they think that once they start the glasses for their child, the degree will continue to go up yeah. and they will have to keep changing glasses. Yes, yes. So they think that a protective mechanism is to delay even mm. correcting yes, the, yes. with single vision glasses. So that is a misnomer and it's even happening at this day and age in Singapore. Yes. I think the prevalence worldwide is increasing, mm. even in underdeveloped areas. It's just that in the developed areas, it's much more marked and prominent and it's getting out of hand because the numbers were high to begin with and it's continued to climb. Mm. So in Singapore, I mean the rates is now at 18 years old, we are at about 80 to 85% myopic. So those who enlist in the army, can you imagine? Every 10 uh, new recruits, 8 of them are myopic. And these myopic patients, you know, if their myopic, myopia is high and they have any other uh, eye issues, complications secondary to myopia, they will get downgraded you know, for, for, for their national service and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that myopia is not just a refractive error correction. There are so many other areas that myopia can impact. It can impact the quality of life, quality of vision, psychological level, social and economic burden. To come back to your question just maybe a little bit further, um, what we do see is that North Asia tends to have a much higher myopia prevalence. So, and by that I mean China, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. This population somehow seems to have a much, we see a much higher prevalence. Um, and then there's another sort of a set of learnings around if you go to China that you compare developed city versus the rural areas and there are plenty of researches that indicate in the rural areas you tend to have a much lower prevalence and perhaps you get a lot more sunlight, you look at the distance a lot more so the, the visual practice is very different in rural areas and, and then you compare that to the COVID-19 learnings that you heard and as people go indoor and much nearer then that prevalence increases so, so I think there are a number of different factors coming yeah. from a layman Even in Singapore, as, as Dr. Fu says, we, we did a research a few years ago and the parents would say, I live with myopia, so I don't know why my child should have a different solution. I don't know why that's necessary. Um, and I don't know if that works. That was another uh, typical response we get from parents. I don't know if that myopia management stuff works. So I think that those are the bigger barriers than anything. Firstly, I'd like to emphasize that myopia is a disease, not merely an inconvenience. Secondly, I'd like to inform the parents that we do have a range of myopia control interventions that are currently available that can suit your child to their own needs. And thirdly, it is advisable to act early with early interventions to prevent myopia from escalating.
Basically, mm. it's a myth that you know, myopia. Once you do LASIK, and everything will be back to normal. But the truth about myopia is that、uh, the increase in degrees, as well as the increase in axial length, the length of the eyeball, is irreversible once the progression of myopia sets in. So the longer the eyeball, the greater the myopia. LASIK. What we do is we laser the cornea. To flatten the cornea, just akin to like wearing auto K lenses or wearing contact lenses or wearing glasses. Basically, LASIK correct the refractive error, but it doesn't change the fact that the eyeball has already lengthened, and hence it comes with the various myopic related or high myopic related complications like retina tear, retina detachment, myopic macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataract, and so on, which can lead to blindness if severe.